subleasing etiquette 101. So back on the subject of subleasing, beyond the scope of your legal jargon, whether or not the original lease agreement states you can even sublease that space, whether or not the amount that the original business is asking from you is something that you can afford, depending on not if the opening hours, closing hours, location is in the environment or in the neighborhood where it works for you and your particular clientele and your target market. Skipping over all of that, we're moving forward to whether or not you actually click with the business that you're considering subleasing from. I want you to really, really think about this. I want you to get rid of the assumptions that you might have about a business that you're considering subleasing from. Even if you know this individual, you know a lot about their business, if you've been watching them for some time, if you think that they're very friendly, if you think that they have a lot of clientele, if you think they're very successful, I want you to take all of that and I just want you to set that aside for a moment and I want you to let the dust settle so that you can see very clearly. And the reason why I'm saying this is because when you go to sublease from someone, it is more than just a roommate situation as business owners. It is more on the level of being married. It's more on the level of sharing expenses, sharing success, sharing reputation. And if you get involved in a sublease agreement with the wrong business, you can damage or you're, you can take a hit to your own business reputation just by default and just by association. And that's the reason why I'm telling you, if you are considering subleasing and you think you've got all the boxes checked and okay, I can afford it, beautiful, okay, I can, there's a space for my poles, beautiful, check. The landlord said it's great, beautiful, check. Uh, it looks like they have the type of clientele that I like, beautiful, check. It looks like in a good space, it's near a mall or it's near wherever, check. Stop for a minute and I want you to think deeper. Have you put a check next to the actual business owner themselves? Have you really dug deep and thought about their pet peeves? What are their requirements? What are things that they're gonna require out of you? Small items. Okay, let's think about this for a minute. Heat and air. Are you required to split the cost? If you are, do you know the cost of that? If you're not, why? Is it because they control the heat and air of the building? If so, is that heat and air going to be comparable to what you need to provide for your clients? We run a fitness business. We are very active. So the heat and air that we require as a pole studio is very different from an office setting. Something that is more laid back and where your body is more at rest. You need to make sure of that. Because what if the business owner says, hey, listen, I don't turn my heat up past 69 or I don't turn my air uh, lower than 74 and you start to get complaints from your clients. Clients will literally leave your studio with complaints saying it's too hot or it's always cold in there and I'm not comfortable. What about this? What about the cleaning expectations? Are things kept well? Is aesthetics complementary to your business? Are you walking into uh, leaky ceiling tiles, damaged floors, bathrooms that they won't keep up. What are you walking into? And does that fit your business model? Is that how you want to be represented? Or do they have a rodent problem? Do they have bugs? How do they keep their space clean? Especially post COVID, like knowing COVID is going on, what are their measures to keep their space clean? And then what are their expectations for you? Are you required to spend money on the cleaning budget? Segue to that, what of theirs are you allowed to use besides the actual space, if anything? Are you actually allowed to possess a key? Sometimes you're not. Sometimes you will sublease from a place and they will not give you a key. You have to use your space during the times that they're open. You need to think about that as well. Another big detractor for our industry are children. Does the business that you're considering subleasing from allow young children into their space. And if they do, 
are they permitted in the area that you will have your pole equipment in? And if they are, what happens if a young child gets on the pole and injures themselves? What happens if an adult gets on your pole and injures themselves? Who's responsible? Do you have something to cover you? These are things that you must no. Also, what happens if someone gets on your pole and damages it? Is your area going to be able to be locked up? You need to figure that out. These are actual questions that you need to ask. You need to ask about music and neighbors, something that you might not realize. If they are in a retail center, it's not a standalone building. So a retail center, you have a neighbor on one side or a neighbor on both sides and you're playing music and say the business that you're subleasing from is not typically a business that plays loud music. But in a pole studio, there are gonna be times where you have to turn your music up. You have to. The beats per minute and the way that it vibes with your body like also helps through the fitness aspect of it. If you are having a bachelorette party or a pole party, like it's not a library. We wanna get turned up, we want the energy up. That's what we're looking for. And you wanna satisfy your clients. So with that being stated, how does it affect the neighboring businesses? How does it affect the business that you're subleasing from? If you're trying to sublease from a massage studio, that's not gonna be conducive for you. You're gonna have, are you gonna have your clients tiptoeing around and not able to actually let go and be themselves, to laugh at themselves, to laugh with their peers, to just enjoy the experience? Or are you gonna be shushing them every time you turn around because you're so intimidated by the person that you're leasing space from through a sublease that you can't even have an enjoyable experience, that you walk around that building on eggshells because you're so intimidated. You need to really go through with a fine tooth comb. How is my business? What are my hours? What type of clientele? Is this business gonna have a problem if somebody comes through with booty shorts and high heels on? Or do I need to set a expectation for my clients? Things. What kind of parking spaces? Do I have designated parking spaces? You need to figure these things out, okay? Also, you wanna think about the staff that the actual business you're subleasing from has on board. Can you put your marketing materials in the main business area? Think about that. These are questions, again, that you want to decide. If we will not just get up and marry somebody just off the rip because it looks like a great opportunity, then we definitely should not put our business inside of another business just because it looks like a great opportunity. Because the consequences of that is that one, you will have given your clients a horrible experience if things don't work out. And then two, you'll have to relocate when you're just trying to get your footing. And when it comes to looking for a space to sublease, those are often so much harder to find than an actual lease. So you have to be very strategic in a sublease situation because you just never know what you could be up against. It's like you already have the main lease and then you have the sublease and you have a lot more rules added on top of your already existing rules. So you're almost governed by three different parties, your clients, your the person you're subleasing from, and the main building owner who's leasing that space. Then you're also governed by your own abilities and what you can put out and what you can't. So you have to really consider that. Subleasing is truly a great option when you're trying to get your business established, your brand put together and work through the kinks. But my advice to all of you polepreneurs out there is that listen, that you go out and you try to get your space as fast as possible because subleasing, just like a marriage, you could be with somebody for years and then they get up and they have an epiphany and they change. At any point in time, that main business could decide that, hey, I would like to go another way. I just ran into an additional revenue, revenue opportunity and I believe that it could bring me more business than your rent. So I would like to move you out of my space and I would like to put my full business into that space. So you have to consider those things and you want to strategically, strategically plan what you actually need to get out of subleasing. And then you want to make sure you ask the right questions when going into it, when considering it, and when having that conversation. And please do not assume that because you know the business owner or you know the business 
that it's just a cakewalk and you're gonna walk in and everything's gonna be peachy because I promise you, everybody has their pet peeves and at some point there's gonna be an issue that you might have to work through and talk out. So again, this series is not to discourage any startup pole studio or existing pole studio from subleasing, but it's definitely to give you the tools that you need to make sure that you could do a sublease as successfully as possible while you get your business off the ground. And just to remind you, don't get too settled into a sublease agreement because the space is not actually leased with you. So I hope that you found this video very beneficial. I hope that you jotted down some notes. And if you have, please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And thank you so much for watching. Bye.